Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Float Fishing Live and Artificial Baits. Going to be talking to Captain Patrick Kelly of Captain Smiley Fishing Charters out of the Little River area. We're going to be covering slip floats, popping corks, and hybrid corks, all in the pursuit of inshore species. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now here in our latest and greatest efforts, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. And it is in this podcast series that we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. Our idea is we want to empower you. We want you to get you excited so that you grab your family and friends and get out on the water spending more time together more often. I'm joined in this episode, just as I am every episode, with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative and Billy Welcome to yet another episode of the Saltwater Series. Here we go, Gary. I'm excited, man. It's going to be a good show. I'm familiar with Patrick and his, what he does, so it's uh, exciting. He does a lot of cool stuff in the fishing industry, so I'm stoked to be be listening to him and getting some of that expertise for sure. Yeah, man. He's been in the game for a long time. I got to say, I'm, I've, I enjoy fishing with him my one trip a year. I enjoy that he fishes our Ocean Isle Inshore Challenge that's down there. I mean, there's a lot to say, and I'm looking forward to having him in this venue. I mean, part of me is just proud that the podcast series we started is attractive to captains like Patrick, who will take time out of their schedule you know, to share with us. Man, I'm, yeah. I take that as a compliment. And the, the part you enjoy most about fishing with him is when he hooks the fish and then hands you the rod. <laughs> well, Sometimes, sometimes I say, do you mind just bringing the fish for me and then just handing me the fish for the photo? I just don't feel like reeling right That's now. That's yeah. I'm tired. My, my knuckles are sore. <laughs> and then sometimes I say, I'm just going to be back at the dock, and if you guys would just pick me up once you put a couple of fish in the boat, then we'll go out for a photo shoot. So it could go any way. It could go any number of ways. <laughs> Oh man! Well, speaking of uh, speaking of boats and trailer hitches and all that fun stuff, uh, I'm going to shout out some of our sponsors really quickly. First of all, we have RA Hitch there in the Raleigh Apex area. Hitches, trailers, bike racks, and uh, just a lot of different products for the outdoorsman outdoors lady and it's just because you're not in the area gary it doesn't matter they get a website they'll work with you they'll get it wherever you need it to be so go see chris and his team mention the fisherman's post podcast and say hey give me that 20 bucks off that's what those guys at the fish post place said and uh and they'll give you 20 bucks off your purchase and just tell them that you uh, learned about it from us to save 20 bucks yeah man quality stuff if you look at the website at, at any length you'll see it's quality stuff he's selling so you're going to be happy with your purchase yeah absolutely man and then another sponsor we have here on the show is marine warehouse which you guys are familiar they're a staple in our podcast man we've really enjoyed having them on since episode number five and so here's a quick word from them we'll be right back Hey, it's Robbie with Marine Warehouse Center in Wilmington and Charleston. We are headquarters for Pair Custom Boats. These center consoles are handmade in Washington, North Carolina, and are custom designed for fishing and family fun on the water. Right now, we have several models in stock, and build times on the custom orders are around five months. These boats are custom built to fit your needs, from the seating, the tops, the leaning posts, and the live wheels. You design the entire layout of your boat. Come by and see for yourself why they're one of the fastest growing boat builders in the country. All right, custom boats. Go custom get them. Boats. Sales, service, parts. I hope we're doing our job of branding those guys as being part of the boating fishing community and not just selling to it. I hope we're doing our job there because we are very fond of them. Yeah, man, they, they support a lot of stuff in the community, and that's why, you know, when we were going, when we were looking for sponsor and someone to partner with, and uh, you know, like really partner with, we we're like, man, Marine Warehouse Center. They're already supporting so much of the fishing industry, and so we really like it, and, and we want to support them, and we really want to support Terrell, and. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> His in his comedy. I want career. everyone to support. Terrell. I want everyone to go in and say, Terrell, let me give you some better jokes. That's what I'm hoping for. Go buy a boat so Terrell can afford joke lessons, right? Is that what we're getting so, at? Yeah, man. So I'm sitting on a stoplight and Terrell, I look down and Terrell's calling me. And of course, I didn't answer. I'm like, geez. And then he texts me and says, I'm right behind you in this light, man. I saw you deny my call. So then I answered, of course, and I. 
I mean, the jokes the jokes need help. Do you are you ready to hear this one? I'm ready, man. I'm always down here. And again, joke. this to be clear, this is Terrell's joke. This is not Gary Hurley talking. Terrell's joke. What TV show do fish like the most? I legitimately try to answer these, but I really don't know. Tuna Half Men. <laughs> Okay, that was pretty good. That was pretty good, Terrell. I'm going to give you that one. Point for Terrell. All right. I'll I'll concede a point for Terrell. That's funny. But still go in and give him some jokes. Two and a half, man. I love it. All right. Um, hey, how about a fish photo? There we go. I got a fish photo for you. We got Colton Merritt of Denver with a 25 and a half inch flounder caught on live pogey on the South Carolina side near Lockwood Folly Inlet. That fish is big man i barely even got it there in the picture you can see i had to add some uh, background and shrink it up and do all the photoshop magic to it yeah man that south carolina line i mean that's an advantage that our guest captain patrick kelly has man he's down there in south carolina land with a different flounder season than the north carolina anglers that mm-hmm. are in our heartland so it you know i'm sure he i would hope He's somewhat of a salesman and points that out as we're talking today. But I figured I'd go ahead and throw out, you know, that flounder differential that he has an advantage in South Carolina. Hey, uh, and to help us really be sharp, we have found that it pays to drink coffee. It does pay to drink coffee. And as you'll notice, once again, I'm out. I'm out of coffee. Somebody said, we never see you drink coffee on the show. That's why we don't buy you coffee because I never have any. So I need you to buy me some more coffee. And buy Gary a cup of coffee, too. I'm not selfish. So head over to buymeacoffee.com slash Fisherman's Post. Support us. Buy us a coffee. And it's really a cool place to support creators, uh, podcasters, all that. And a lot of a lot of people on the platform over there. But make sure you support us first, and then you can <laughs> give your lunch money to someone else later. <laughs> Man, I want to I believe you, but that leftover quote-unquote coffee looks more like the tail end of a lemonade or something. <laughs> Dude, it's just the ice, man. I drink cold coffee. Yeah, anyway. All right. Hey, uh, Billy, when I come back after talking with Patrick, as is tradition on the show, I'm coming to you for Billy's ready. best takeaway. It's going to be awesome. Billy's best takeaway. But right now, the conversation turns to Captain Patrick Kelly of Captain Smiley Fishing Charters out of the Little River area talking about float fishing live and artificial baits. Patrick, welcome to the show, man. A pleasure to have you on as a guest. Hey. Hey, Gary. It's good seeing you. Hey, Billy. Hey, Patrick. Good to see you, man. Hey, uh, Patrick, yeah. before we talk about the very effective technique of float fishing live and artificial baits, as is tradition on the show, we got two questions for you to get through. Whenever you're ready, let me know, and I'll hit you with question number one. Hit me! All right. Question number one, why in the world should anyone listen to what Patrick Kelly has to say about either <laughs> float rigs or inshore fishing? Oh goodness. Oh man. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, not so tough, but you know, I've been doing it a long time. You know, fishing's just, uh, it's just a uh, part of my uh, existence. Um, I've been doing this before Google earth. How about that? <laughs> that's a good one. So I, I like to think that I earned all my spots, you know, a lot of the holes in the little river, uh, border area, North and South Carolina. I learned them. I, I earned them. I walked back there to find them. I got in kayaks. You know, I got myself tra- trapped by the tide. Uh, I've done it. So uh, how about that? I've done it before Google Earth. Acceptable. <laughs> Acceptable answer. We'll proceed with question number two, which typically is a non-fishing related question. For question number two, I played off of Captain Smiley, and so it got me thinking about smiles. So this is really just an opinion piece. It's something that you can't even get wrong. Are you ready? I'm going to give you a couple of smiles. You tell me which are the better smiles. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. Which is the was better that, smile? Was that the first one? <laughs> <laughs> which is the better That's smile? That's the one I'm looking for right there. <laughs> Heath, Heath Ledger's The Joker or Jack Nicholson's The Shining? Uh, Jack Nicholson. The famous photo of his <laughs> head coming through the bathroom door with that crazy yeah, smile. Yeah. Comparison yeah. number two, <laughs> Cheshire Cat or Garfield? Uh, Garfield. I'm going to disagree with him on that, but <laughs> I don't necessarily have to say that out loud. Last See, question. I, I'm not a cat guy, so I don't, I don't know what a Cheshire uh, <laughs> cat is. So. 
Last question. <laughs> Best smile. Julia Roberts, Farrah Fawcett. Oh, Julia. Most definitely. Yeah, you got to be pretty yeah, old. Yeah, pretty woman. Well, they're both pretty oh, women, yeah. but I think I'm guessing that over she's half got those people got those she's got those Fawcett. She's oh, I'm, I used to have the calendar over my bunk bed. Remember the one the the she's wearing that one piece. Yeah, I remember. She's got that uh, 80, 80s hair. The blanket. Yeah, powder. but uh, Julia. Yeah, Julia's. I love her lips, though. I mean, she's just she's hot. Uh, all right, <laughs> I accept. <laughs> I accept the answer. I accept the defense, and I'm going to move on to fishing. Yeah. So I think float fishing yeah. live and artificial baits. I mean, unless you tell me otherwise, we'll start with the ever popular slip float rig. Yeah, absolutely. It's a tried and true uh, classic way of fishing uh, all along the Carolinas. Uh, you know, they use it down in, in Georgia, Florida, probably in Virginia. But um, it's a great way to find fish, especially if you're in an area that looks fishy. You're not real sure if there's fish there. But uh, you can simply just lob these things out there, drop them right behind your boat in the current and just let them go and look for fish. Um, on most of these small uh, reels, these 2,500, 3,000 class reels that we use, um, most of them carry about two, 200 yards of, of, of braided line or more. And uh, you, can, you can drift these things in the current and, and just look for fish with them. Um, and once you find the fish, you can reposition your boat or your body or wherever you are if you're on the bank and move closer to the fish. So it's a great way to find fish. Um, at different depths, at different distances. Um, so it's uh, really easy. It's visual. Uh, there are bobbers that we'll talk about that have sounds that attract a lot of saltwater fish. So um, especially in the charter business, we need help, and these bobbers help a lot. So it's definitely uh, you know something that's very common, especially in the Carolinas. So for you, what makes up the most successful slip bobber rig? Like how do you tie it? What do you use? You know, walk me through. So if someone is a little unfamiliar and they want to say, all right, I'm yeah. going to tie one on, what do you got for me? Yeah, we call it the slip float uh, rig. Uh, well, that's the first one we'll talk about because there's also pop and corks. But we'll talk about a slip float rig. And what's unique about a slip float rig is that you can adjust the depth on your float, uh, which which means I got, I've got one right here. This is, this is a hybrid type of bobber. But you have a little slide here that you'll you'll run on your line and this this little bead right here it's like a r little rubber bead and it, it goes up and down your line so the further you move it up your line towards your reel the deeper you can run your bobber you're gonna have weight to sink your sink your line and your bait down and then your bobber is gonna hit the stopper knot at whatever depth you set your stopper on um, so um, that makes it really unique as far as finding fish in deeper areas. So you can drop this thing. You can drop your bait down as deep as 10 feet or more if you wanted to. I usually don't go over 10 feet, the areas I'm fishing. Um, or you can run it as shallow as, you know, one or two feet with your leader. So that makes it really unique to where you can drift a live bait down the bank at a certain depth. And that's how you adjust your your depth with this little rubber slide right here. Uh, so that's the first thing you'd put on your line. Well, let's talk about, if you want to, we'll talk about um, the rig itself, uh, the rod, and the, the line, and all that stuff if you want to. We'll, um, yeah, man, you, you can give me the that. quick on the rod <laughs> and the reel and the line, you know, but okay. I, I do dig the details on the rig itself, and I, I'm not really sure how to proceed. Yeah, sure. Whether or not, well, you go ahead and keep talking, and I'll, I'll ask questions as they come Okay. Up. Okay, it's your typical light tackle rod that you use, you know, whether you're jigging or, or whatever. You use a spin casting rod and reel, light to medium. Uh, some people use like a medium type rod, um, fast action. Um, on these 3,000 class reels, I, I, I pack them with 20 pound braid. It's your common setup that just about anyone uses along the area to, to jig fish or, or throw a Carolina rig or what have you. Um, voodoo's or artificial baits little little plastics um so you got tons of i use power pro the 20 pound power pro 
And then I'll use a long piece of fluorocarbon leader that's also 20 pound. This is really important. Um, so I use a, a fluorocarbon leader about 10 foot. I, like I said, I don't usually run my bobbers deeper than 10 feet. So I'll put about a 10, 10 pound fluorocarbon leader onto my braided line. And I'll, I'll connect it with the uni uni knot, which is a real common knot. Everyone's using that for attaching any sort of leader. Uh, the reason why I use the uni is super strong. You can cast it through the guides on your rod. So that's, that's your first thing. You got this long piece of fluorocarbon leader. And the reason I use a fluorocarbon leader is because if you were to take this slide I was telling you about, this little rubber slot, these things get worn out pretty easy. If you put it right on your braided line, it's not going to stick very long. So you, you'll slide it a few times, and then you notice that it's not staying at the level that you want uh, to keep um, your bait down at. So it, it holds a little bit better on the fluorocarbon leader. So that's why I have that attached to the braided line. So you got your bobber stop right here. That's the first thing you put on there. And then you'll put a bead to stop your bobber up to your bobber stop. And then you have your, your cork itself. This is the hybrid cork, but you can also use your traditional long, you know, those long uh, flow, flow corks. You know, you've seen them from this big to a foot big. So it's whatever choice you decide to use. So you put your bobber on there and then I've got a three quarter ounce egg sinker on this rig right here. So that's going to drop your, your weight, your, your bait down. And then I'll put another, another stopper. And then I've got a, a swivel. I have my swivel and then my leader, which is about 18 inches long. And then I like to use treble hooks, depending on the size bait, we'll use a number six or even a number four. So it depends on what size bait you're using. We really like trout, treble hooks. When we trout, trout fish, um, we use a lot of live shrimp. So the treble hooks seem to work better for us. But that's your typical slip float rig. Um, like I said, it's pretty important that I, to use that fluorocarbon because, I mean, you can use that braided line and put your, your slips stopper on there, your stopper, um, but it just wears out so fast. It seems to last longer on this fluorocarbon leader. Um, so, uh, that's, so gotta, that's the rig in a nutshell right there So on the slip float rig. Yeah, man. So not talking about popping corks yet, still staying with the slip, slip float rig. Yeah. The slip. What mm -hmm. goes into, what goes in the decision making in your mind about one float versus another float, a hybrid versus the long, like cigar versus just the more like medium ball type shape. Like, is there different applications where you would use a different one or, or that, that's overthinking. Uh, there is. It seems. Uh, it, it seems like it, the popping corks. I usually run a really short leader on those. Um, I, it, which is the popping. The poppet cork is. I've got one here, but um, I like these concave ones like this. Uh, this brand is Bomber, but it's got kind of a cone shape. It makes a really heavy splash. It also makes a lot of racket. Um, I like these fish in shallow water. You can fish, you know, ledges and, and things like that. You know, trout can come from the deep to come up to the top. Um, but a lot of times we're targeting redfish, maybe a little deeper. So the slip, slip bobber uh, might tend to work a little bit better. Just depends on your area where you're fishing. Sometimes the tide is up high and you want to fish off those oyster beds a little bit. Um, so you can drop it down along those oyster beds where you feel like the, the redfish would be or flounder or trout or whatever you're targeting, black drum. Um, I like using these on the flats. Like if we're, we're fishing a really shallow flat, say two foot deep, maybe three foot deep. Um, I really like using these. And I, would, I wouldn't use the slip float as much because a lot of times if you're trying to make a lot of racket, these hybrid, hybrids will make a lot of racket but it'll just put so much pressure on your slide. It'll just wear that out. You just can't stay in the zone where, where you want to keep, keep your bait. Okay. Uh, I hopefully it made some sense to you. <laughs> no, yeah, that did. And then as far as just the slip float rig, like no popping cork, there's different bobber options, float options. What goes into the mentality of, Hey, I want to have a bigger which float or a less float. Yeah. Which, how, how do we decide? Well, you know, like, like I said, it's visual. I, you know, a lot of times I get customers on my boat. 
they can't see very well. So you might need a bigger bobber so they can see it, a taller one, one that sits up higher out of the water. You know, these things are pretty small. These top and corks, I mean, that's not the, you know, three and a half inches. I mean, that's not a lot to see if you're drifting this thing way out there. This isn't a lot of uh, stuff to see. So um, I might use a bigger bobber if, if uh, my client can't see very well um, and we're trying to make long drifts. You know, hopefully we get bit before we get way, way down the bank. But, you know, so um, that kind of makes my, my decision on what type of bobber to use. Okay. So. So maybe walk me through now an application of that because I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I'm, I'm going to follow your lead on this, but we've got our slip float rig. I think you covered the parts of it and, you know, the whys very well. So I don't know, like uh -huh. put me on the boat and tell me the when and where if I'm using it to target red drum or trout. Like I, okay. I would say pick something and, and give me the application. Okay, well, uh, being in the charter business, we're real specific about where we're going to stop. And so, you know, we're pulling up on specific spots uh, during certain tides. A lot of spots we fish are only good for 15 to 30 minutes, and the tide the tide moves up or the tide moves down, and then the fish move out or in or wherever. Uh, so um, we always look for current, you know, especially if you're using the slip bobber rig. Uh, where you're fishing different depths, you're always looking for tight for, for a nice line of current. That's more than likely where your trout are going to be. There, you, it, it's a you can see a spot, and you'll see uh, like a line of of tide moving. Uh, so you want a good flow, you want good movement. So that's one thing. You know, if you're not familiar with the area, that's you know something to look for that's good. Current is very good, uh, especially with speckled sea trout. Uh, we fish out the jetties a lot. You know, you can cover a lot of ground down the rocks, you know, usually the, the ends of the jetties are usually the better spots for speckled trout and redfish, like the first, you know, 200 feet of the east, the west, the inside. All right, so Patrick, out there on the jetties, and you're using the slip float rig to cover water, so walk me through like what would happen am i just dropping it off like the back of the boat is there any kind of cast involved and and then maybe as you coach you know your clients who have never fished it before some of what you tell them to do to like play out the line keep contact yeah you know, whatever it is like pretend i'm on yeah. the boat and how do you help me out for success um uh, well i try to get this the boat set up to where the distance i want to be off the rocks you don't want to get too close because it can be dangerous out there um, especially on the inside of the jetties, uh, the outside's a little, you know, depending on the wind direction, uh, you definitely want to set your boat up to where you're safe and where the fish are. Uh, but you want to get fairly close. Um, you want to make it as easy as you can. So you don't have to cast as much, especially with my customers, because you don't want to lose these bobbers up in the rocks and, uh, you know, uh, you get clients up there and they pull up to the rocks and the first cast, boom, right in the rocks. So you like to get it set up to where your boat is positioned right in the current to where you can simply just do a little flip over the side or even just drop it down off the transom of the boat. Uh, more than likely, your bow is going to be facing uh, into the current uh, and then the back of the boat, you're just going to be able to drop your bobber right in that current. That's the easiest way. It keeps you out of trouble. Um, because it can, it can be a little tricky with those rocks, especially with casting. So you got to be pretty precise where you, where you put it. Um, so the easiest way to go about it is just to drop it behind the boat. And it's like flying a kite. You flip your bail, hold the line in your, in your I'm, I'm a right-handed angler, so I'll hold the rod in my right hand. I'll hold the line in my left hand. I'll just feed it out like I'm feeding a kite up in the wind, except you're dropping a bobber back. You're just letting a little bit of slack out always letting your bobber stay upright. It seems like for some reason when you put the brakes on your bobber, it, your bait just won't won't ride right and you, you won't get a bite. So you want your bobber to sit just upright, straight. So you need to let out slack. You need to have slack in your line. Um, so the easiest way to go about it is just drop it off the back of the boat, drift it in the current. You let it drift down the edge of the rocks. You have your depth set. Uh, five foot is kind of the average out on the rocks for me. Um, you can drop it as deep as I said, 10 foot. Um, but you need to pay attention how deep you're dropping it because you want to find the level where the fish are. Um, 
like I said, most of the time my level is about five feet. That's usually where I start when I'm fishing the, the jetties. You're going to let your line go in the current. You're going to feed it out like you're, you're like you're flying a kite, but you're just letting line out, letting your bobber drift in that current and letting it ride up just right down those rocks. When you see that bobber go under, that's obviously you got a bite. So it's very visual. Visual, you know you have a bite. So what you're going to do is immediately take your your left hand, slap that bobber shut. Take your left hand, immediately start reeling. I keep my rod tip down low to, to resist all the wind that I can. Reel that line as tight as you can. When you feel your line get tight with the fish, then you just simply simply lift, set the hook on the fish, and bring them in. So the saying goes with these bobbers, crank it before you yank it. You know, you see guys, especially, uh, you know, I, I did a, lot, a, a little bit of fly fishing in Alaska, and we were mending, we were using... Uh, Sight indicators is what they call them, but it's just a bobber, you know, pretty much. And we are always mending our line uh, in the river current, always keeping that line ahead of your bobber. And, and then we just immediately set the hook. So a lot of people think that's what you have to do when you see that bobber go under, set the hook. In, in the case with all the current that we deal with, especially when you're stationary, you want to crank first before you yank. So you want to reel as fast as you can when you see that bobber get down, go down. You'll feel it get tight with the fish, then you lift. So crank it before you yank it. That's the best tip I can give you as far as bobber fishing. So that's that's it in a nutshell on the jetties. So what? Uh, let's talk more about what's on the hook there. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Are you? I I guess in live shrimp, whether it's trout or red drum. Maybe walk me a little bit through what I need to think about if I'm putting a live shrimp on that treble. But then tell me about some of the other stuff that you'll drift on the jetties, you know, when you when live shrimp isn't available or or maybe there's even yeah. a better option. Yeah, you do. Uh, you know, the best option is definitely shrimp, especially now. I mean, really, any time of the year, if you can find shrimp in our area, in the Carolinas, and I'm sure Georgia, Florida as well, uh, you want live shrimp. Um, it's really difficult to find this time of year. Uh, it being, what is it, mid-May now. They start showing up. You will be able to find some smaller, you know, throw your cast net, and, and you might find some small, like, two- to three-inch shrimp. But shrimp is the best bait year-round, bar none. Um, you know, the uh, a lot of times of the year, uh, I call them pecker fish. The croakers, pinfish, all that stuff can be very aggravating. Uh, so then I'll, I might flip a... Uh, a Berkeley Gulp shrimp. I love those things. If the if the little small pecker fish are there, that's a great option to use. Uh, if you can't find shrimp, or if the pecker fish are are eating all your shrimp, uh, so that's a great plastic to use. Of course, there's mud minnows. That's something we use this time of year. Uh, small finger mullet work really well. Um, little pieces of shrimp, even uh, little pieces of fresh cut shrimp, will even work for you. Curly tail jigs, any sort of curly tails, they seem to work pretty well. Um, with the artificials, I don't use a treble hook. You know, I'll use a 132nd ounce jig hook. I've got some of those in the bag here. I think I do. Yeah, they've got these up at the Bass Pro Shop, but they're kind of like those Hank Brown uh, style, if you're familiar with uh, fishing jigs. The Hank Brown's a really popular Florida jig, um, but this is kind of a, a knockoff of those. They're, they're, you find them up at Bass Pro Shop, but it's a really light uh, jig hook, and I'll, I'll, I'll hook my artificial bait onto one of these. Um, also, mud minnows work great on these hooks as well, and mullet. Um, so you got shrimp, you got mud minnows, you got mullet, you got artificial baits. I really love the Berkeley Gulps. I've, you know, ever since those things came out, I've I haven't stopped using the gulps. They work awesome. The scent's awesome. Um, you know, they don't look super great, but they work. You know, whatever's in those things, they work well. Uh, any sort of curly tails, I mean, there's loads of different companies. There's, uh, you know, Berkeley Gulp makes the makes curly tails. Uh, you got trout tricks. There's all different kinds out there. You can even use paddle tails or any sort of plastics that you like. Uh, you can drift those on, on the on the bobbers. A lot of the artificials, I might use the popping cork mo more so, get that sound attractor uh, to get the bite to help out with all that movement with artificial bait. But um, those are the different kind of baits, at least that we use in our area, but shrimp being the number one for sure. So 
how about this, man? So when you're walk me through this because I love specifics. I just imagine the reader, I mean the listeners and the viewers do too. So I'm going to go back to live bait and then circle back around to the artificials. Okay. Live bait. How are you hooking a shrimp? How are you hooking a mullet? How are you hooking a mud minnow? You know, okay. any, any specifics are appreciated. Okay. With the, sh- with the shrimp I'm using, you know, depending on the size shrimp I'll use, if it's a larger shrimp, I might use a, a number four. If I, if I have a smaller shrimp, I might use a number six treble hook. Um, I hook them right through the horn. You'll see the, the black dot. I guess the brain of the shrimp. You want to go just forward of that along the horn. It's got that pointy horn. Just go right through the tip of that. It keeps them alive. They'll kick around real nice, um, and and it's plenty of room for that hook to get inside the fish. So um, that's how I hook my shrimp uh, with the mud minnows, uh, mullet. I go through the lips most of the time. If you're getting short strikes, you might want to hook them on the back of the tail, a little further back on the tail. But almost most of the time, I go right through the lips. Uh, I go through both the lips on finger mullet and the mud minnows. So they stay on the hook well, casting. Of course, mud minnows stay alive. I mean, it's a great bait to use just because you can, you know, depending on the temperature, you can leave them in your in your live well. And, and you know, you hear the story of, yeah, I put my boat up in the shed and I, I had a couple dozen mud minnows in my, in my live well tank and they put it up in the shed. I didn't fish for a month. They dropped it down and they were still alive. So it's a great bait to uh, have, to always have, is the mud minnows. Of course, shrimp, they can be very difficult to keep alive. We, we have bubbler uh, pumps in all of our boats, so that helps out. If you have an aerator, we just have bubbler systems that, that roll, run into our, uh, our trolling motor batteries, 36-volt systems. We plug it in at night. It's always giving constant power uh, to our um, aerating, our mullet, um, and our shrimp. So. That's that's definitely a, a good helpful t- tip to keep your bait alive, you know. So on those jetties, man, when we're in about yeah. yeah, man, no, that's good. And and on those jetties, when we're in about like I think you said average in five or looking for the five foot water, is that the right depth? I mean, are you throwing popping corks out there too, or are you looking for shallow? For some reason, for for some reason, the popping corks. They, I, I haven't had much luck on the on the jetties. Like I said. You want to get it down a bit. So, like I said, five five feet is about the 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 go to depth for at least for us uh, to to get your bait down along the jetty. So, popping corks really don't get that bite, that trout bite that we look for out there. Um, why? I you know I haven't quite figured that out, but it seems like getting them down. You know, you think of the jetties as a as like a pyramid shape, and you want to find the baits along that pyramid. It seems like about five the five foot drop off the deep, you know, goes from, you know, that there's uh, towards the end of our rocks, it could be 30 foot deep. So uh, you need to get your baits down. It seems like the pop popping corks just, you know, it, it keeps it up on the surface too high for the, for the trout and the reds to find. So um, that's been my, my experience, at least along the jetties with the popping corks. All right. So now in your area and I'm going back inside, are you a bigger fan of just a like a long, deeper grass bank? Are you a fan of the oyster rocks? Like, what is the scenario, you know, in the application of the float rig or the pop and cork further in shore waters? Well, uh, you're you're looking for a, a, a flat. Okay, this is this is your typical spot, like a flat up against a gra- up against the oyster bed, and then oyster bed r- beds connected to grass. Um, usually, there's a point like a creek coming out. Um, so there's a point of maybe an oyster head, um, and then there's a deeper channel, you know, coming out of the creek or let's say along the intercoastal waterway. Uh, so you got, you know, anywhere, let's take, for instance, the intercoastal waterway has some great fishing for reds, speckled sea trout. Um, so anywhere in the intercoastal waterway at, at low tide, it's supposed to be 13 feet. So you got kind of a deep channel, then it comes up off the bank, let's say about 30 foot off the bank. Uh, where there'll be a ledge about six feet and then it'll go into a flat and then there'll be like a oyster oyster heads or oyster heads along a, uh, along a point where another creek runs out where there might be oysters scattered along the grass so there'll be structure around maybe two points of current that come together uh, you want to find that that piece of current where you can get a long drift along that oyster bed along that grass bed 
and maybe along a drop off. It seems like the trout are usually on a five or six foot drop off along the intercoastal waterway. So if you find that current that runs down that drop off, that's where your trout are going to be. The reds are usually up on that flat, up against the oyster beds, up against the grass around that structure, uh, feeding again. You know, little bait fish will be moving up on the flat. Maybe bait flit fish come off that flat along that ledge. The trout will be on that ledge feeding. Uh, so, you know, you're looking for oyster structure, grass, current, and drop offs. So, hopefully that made some sense to you. <laughs> yeah, man, it did make sense. Is there ever a scenario where you're not anchored up? Is there ever a scenario where you're using a float rig and, and you're drifting as well? Uh, no, I mean, I, I guess you could try it, but I like being stationary. Um, and, and like I said, you can drift your float down that bank. If you get a bite or catch a fish way down that bank, you just move your boat further to where that school of fish, fish are. Uh, you know, put your power pole down or your trolling motor and just uh, get closer to that school of fish. Um, like I said, the best thing about these floats is you can find that school. Um, you catch one fish, you know, there likely could be 20, 30 more fish in that very same spot. So uh, you, can, you can cover a lot of grounds with a float. Man, and I also know that you're, you know, you're, you uh, pride yourselves on getting kids involved in fishing. So I know that was part of like sort of the pre-show notes. So maybe talk to that about just how, how applicable the float rig is when we're trying to get kids into fishing or kids successful at fishing. Oh yeah. It's, it's real visual. So it gives them something to see, something to look at, you know, to where, you know, a lot of times you throw it, you throw something out there and you put it in the rod order with a kid and they just kind of get bored. This is kind of active, so they, they have something to look at, um, and then, they, of course, they can see the bite. When they get a bite, say they miss the fish, and that gets them even more excited. So uh, that's a, a great thing with the kids, especially these popping forks. gives them something to do. If, if it's a little slow day, they can cast this thing anywhere where and just start making a bunch of noise and a lot of splash, so it's, it's a lot of fun for the kids. It's fun for adults. That sound of splash will attract fish and get you a bite. You know, it's, it's pretty wild. You see a six-year-old kid out fishing an adult, and he's using these things. So they work. Well, let's go more into popping cork. So what's the ideal scenario, the ideal environment where you say, no, slip float, give me a popping cork? Uh, a shallow flat. You know, a trout do come up on flats as well. But, you know, reds, uh, flounder uh, will be up in the shallow water, say, three foot or less. Um, so... You can find places like that. You can throw it up against the edge of the grass and just make a huge splash like a bait fish coming out of the grass or making a lot of racket. Um, so I use the, the um, popping corks more in a shallow shallow area scenario instead of a, a, a drop-off ledge, uh, drop-off like a jetty or on the edge of the intercoastal waterway or a, a main channel. Um, so uh, that's why I'd use a pop of cork in. They work really well. Um, this, this winter, there was a school of redfish that, that were just being hard to, to please. I mean, you, you saw them up there and you just couldn't get them to bite. We had live shrimp. We tried everything in the world. Um, just, you know, casting on the bottom, using artificials, whatever, jigging, trying to get the attention of these, these redfish. I put on a bobber, a, a pop and cork came up on this flat and that's what they wanted, man. They, they uh, just would pop it and splash and they would just zone right into on, on it. And it'll get you a bite a lot of times when, when others won't. So the noise of the pop and cork and also this, this cone shaped uh, design here will make a big bubble trail. Um, so it makes a lot of racket and gets, gets the fish attention. So and it if definitely I'm, works. If I'm on your boat, give me the instructions. Like, you know, I say, hey, man, how do you want me to pop this, both just to get the most out of the pop and then how you pattern the pop? Like how often, how much of a pause? Like what advice do you have for us? That's a good question. I, I don't get too too crazy with it. Uh, I did have a guy on my boat from Florida that fished with me years ago, and he was doing it constantly. He believed in it that way. I just, I'm not a believer in constant popping. Uh, so... Uh, what we do is like say every 15 seconds or so, just throw it out there, give it a good, you know, make a good cluck, clucking sound and a good splash every 15 seconds and just let it rest and the fish will come find it and grab it. So uh, 
I don't like doing it too much. Like I said, that guy did it. I didn't see where popping it a lot, you know, making tons of racket, like constantly, uh, would get you the bite. So I, I do it every 15 seconds or so. seems to work pretty well for me. Okay. Hey man, uh, what, uh, what have I not set you up to share, man? What other thoughts did you have in mind about float rigs or popping corks that I haven't given you the opportunity to share? Anything come to mind? Uh, not really, man, but uh, it's it's something I've been using since I was a child. You know, it's it seems like it's just a timeless uh, thing. You know, people, you know, some people kind of snarl at it like, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're more into the fuddy-duddy kind of stuff, which, you know, I love finesse fishing as well. You know, casting artificials, topwater plugs, that sort of stuff, but you can't go wrong with a slip float bobber or even a popping cork. Um They'll get you bites a lot of times when other things won't. Um, it's visual. You can carry your friends out there. You can get kids out there that don't have a lot of experience. Um, and you can get them on fish. So being in the charter business, that's what we have to do. And it's pretty much a standard, at least in our area, of how to fish. So, um, you know, if you haven't tried it, you definitely should. Man, walk me through the Captain Smiley fishing uh, calendar. <laughs> what you guys are targeting in the spring, the summer, fall, and maybe even sure. Here. Yeah, we've had a great uh, spring bite, uh, you know, actually since about February. You know, I, I normally do a big trip every year where I'm, I'm gone most of the winter, uh, but I stuck around this winter and the fishing was awesome. March was incredible. And then uh, I guess this when spring starts. What, what about the middle of March? Um, so, yeah, this, the right off the bat, the spring bite, bite was great. April is usually kind of wishy-washy around – Around uh, the mid-April, when the water temperatures are just trying to find 70 degrees, um, this year it seemed like it took a while to get up to that 70-degree mark. Actually, what's today? Today's the 14th or middle of May now. I mean, it just it just turned 70 degrees around the 1st of May a couple weeks ago. So it was kind of late to get really warm. I like it below 70. It's kind of like that 55 to you know, 68 degrees is just a killer time to fish. Uh, so we're targeting redfish. Speckled sea trout was off the charts this spring and still is pretty good if you can find live shrimp. Um, so we did really well with uh, speckled sea trout this spring. Um, and black drum, we've got a nice stock of, of black drum in our estuary. Uh, so that's what we target in the spring. Uh, flounder are just starting to show up. Um, they've been in the cherry grove. Um, as you well know, Little River is the border of North and South Carolina. Um, so most of your viewers know North Carolina, you can't keep flounder. In South Carolina, you can. So uh, it seems like these smaller inlets like Cherry Grove uh, on the south end of Myrtle Beach around Myrtle's Inlet, Polly's Island, these smaller little uh, swashy type inlets uh, are always the first to get a nice batch of flounder. So the flounder definitely come in, you know, the Cherry Grove area. They're just starting to move into Little River Inlet area. Uh, I know they're showing up in Tubbs Inlet, which is in North Carolina, uh, Shalot Inlet, um, those areas. Most of the flounder, when they first come in, they're pretty small. Um, you know, and as, as the weeks progress into mid-June, we'll start seeing some larger flounder. Um, so flounder is definitely a target species. It's unfortunate that in North Carolina you can't keep them. Uh, you know, I just don't get that, why they shut it all the way down. I mean, at least let you keep one or two. Um, I don't see any any difference in my 21 years of fishing the area uh, where the fishing's any better or any worse as far as flounder fishing. That's just my personal opinion. But we'll target flounder year-round, or excuse me, all summer long. Um, and then we'll also catch speckled sea trout, redfish, uh, black drum. Spanish mackerel are, are around right now, so at the jetties. You possibly could catch bluefish, Spanish mackerel. Right now, um, I know I'm kind of backtracking from what I was talking about summer, but there's bonitos and false albacore have been out around, uh, you know, just offshore. So that is definitely feasible on a on a on a on a nice calm day on a small boat. Uh, but summertime, we're targeting flounder, redfish, speckled trout, black drum, Spanish mackerel, uh, and then about the latter part of September. Uh, through about the third week in October, the big drum, the big spawner start showing up in our inlets. So that kind of kicks off the fall fishing is the big drum bite. 
which is a lot of fun. You know, it's all release fishing. We're using a lot of uh, like cut menhaden and and live menhaden on the bottom. Crabs, uh, blue crabs are great. We're quartering crabs and putting them on the bottom, catching the big drum. But if you fish inside, outside, uh, excuse me, inside of the inlets, away from the big drum, the red, the small redfish bites really good. The speckled sea trout bite goes off the charts about the end of October, all through November and December. Um, so, you know, I'll tell you what, for a small estuary like Little River and in the southern part of North Carolina, we've got some great fish. And especially with all the pressure, it really baffles me how many fish come out of this small area that we have uh, with all the boaters. And, but, uh, you know, the fishing's really, really good. So um, that's kind of that in a nutshell. I love the winter fishing. There's not as many people out there. You know, we'll go up in the shallow creeks. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll search for schooling redfish in these small drop-offs and flats. Uh, that's a lot of fun. You kind of have it all to yourself on the coldest days. You just have to dress for it. But you can fish year-round year in our area, and it's, it's awesome. Well, Patrick, man, thank you. I am definitely a believer in the slip float rig, and I, <laughs> I too, think of it as synonymous with the Little River area. You know, if I go fishing Little River, I'm shocked if I'm not floating something underneath a slip float rig and absolutely uh, yeah man appreciate the relationship through the years and thank you again yeah, for man. making time for us for this podcast yeah man you've been doing this a long time too how long how long has the fisherman's post been in business now 2003 yeah Before about as long google as i've earth. been doing google yeah. earth didn't exist yeah people people were at or you know would would look for that information in the magazine and pictures and you know you, you actually had to earn your spot so I like to think that's why you need to go with me. I did it before <laughs> Google Earth. So. I'm in. Patrick, <laughs> thanks again, man. Hey, Gary. Looking forward to taking your fishing this fall. Hey, Billy, nice nice meeting you, man. Hey, man. Good to meet you. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Gary, what a show, man. He has got me fired up for some inshore fishing. Super excited. So, yeah, it's been good. I mean, I think it's, it's a good. bucket list trip just to – be out on the Little River rocks and float a bait down those rocks underneath the float rig. You know, there's any number of things you can catch, man, but I just feel like it's just something, if you live anywhere around this area, you got to do that fishing at least once, man. I, I think those Little River jetties are a special place. Yeah, man, that and that slip float rig, I was just introduced to that a couple of years ago, and that thing is uh, that thing's an assassin for some redfish. Like, I've done well with that rig, so good. I'm glad he's promoting that like crazy. And uh, best takeaway. <laughs> well, speaking of the slip float rig, crank it before you yank it. That's my <laughs> takeaway. I'm like, that is really good advice because I'm the I'm I'm a uh, I forget his name. Oh, Bill Dance. Yeah, there you I'm, go. I'm Bill Dance. Yeah, I, I want to set the I want to set the hook so hard all the time. But yeah, so crank it before you yank it. Crank it before you yank it. <laughs> what else we got? Let's let's thank Marine Warehouse. That's it. So thank you so much, Marine Warehouse, for being a sponsor of the show. And feel free to go by Marine Warehouse either here in Wilmington, North Carolina, or in the Charleston, South Carolina area, and uh, and submit your jokes to them to submit to the show. Absolutely, help help Terrell out. Or help buy a boat, out. or pick up some <laughs> boat supplies, or have them paint the bottom of your boat, or service your engine, or. Good. Just stop by to give Terrell some jokes. I mean, either way, we're doing our job, I guess. Just give Terrell a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gary, we'll see you in the next episode, man. That was a good one. Yeah, man. All right, thanks. Fisherman's Post. More fish, more often.